Huh? And Laura, I don't think you, you watched it, so uh, you did a good job. You're <laughs> we'll very just, kind. <laughs> we'll just do that again. <laughs> okay, now who, who was host again? Uh, that was me, ICLDC conference. Um, okay. Caroline. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, have you put the hosting privileges back to me? Oops. That was a mess. Let's do... Is Joel still sick? Do we have any updates? Yeah, he posted his app still. Okay. Sammy, sorry, could you please try again giving me hosting privileges? It doesn't look like they've transferred successfully. Let's make sure I gave them to the right person here. So let's, see. oh, it went back to me. Okay, let's see, ILCD conference one, right? Yeah, that's correct. Oh, it's not even letting me click on it. Huh. Let me see if I can just click on your name. Okay. Make host. Nope. Is there a way you can grab it back for me? Um, I thought there was, but I'm not finding it. Should be able to take bottom of the tendencies. Let me, if, let me, no, no, no one's, uh, I'm not able to click on anyone. Oh, I've got it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank good. You. Okay. Thank you. Laura, did you need to be spotlighted? Um, no, it's okay. Okay, thanks. Those awkward last seconds. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're ready, Laura. Wonderful. All right, so let's start this workshop. We are so happy to welcome Michael Reddingwell, who is Northern Cheyenne and Lakota from Indigenous AI, Dr. Noelani Arista, who is Kanaka Maoli from McGill, Car McGill University, Caroline Reddingwell, who is Crow and German from Indigenous AI, Caleb Moses from Maori Descent, who is Dragonfly Data from Dragonfly Data Science, and Joel Davison, who is Gadigal in Tangadi, who unfortunately could not make it today, to present Workshop 7, How to Build Your Own Practical AI Tools for Language Maintenance. And now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. We're very excited to be doing this workshop on the final day of ICLDC. Uh, I do need share screen options, however. I'm sorry, I didn't notice that earlier. To the is host. it available now? It says this is disabled participant screen sharing. Am I a participant? I should be a panelist. Very good. On my side. There we go. Yes, it's working. Now. 
Sorry about that. So I was going to start out by walking you through the, uh, oops, <laughs> there we go. Um, so I was going to start out by giving you a short background on how this uh, tool came to be. And then Caleb is going to take over with an introduction to artificial intelligence after which Michael will walk you through how to uh, customize this tool for your own language. And Noilani will tell us a bit about uh, the dictionary component and also some of the issues that arise with dictionaries. And um, Joel would be the one who would tell you more about the user interface, but fortunately I was also working with him on that. And so I will take over the user interface. And after that, we have Q&A. So without further ado, this all started uh, two years ago. Um, we had a workshop uh, on indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence with 30 participants from all over the world gathering at University of Hawaii at Manoa. And our goal was to reconceptualize AI systems and consider and explore how indigenous protocols, for example, concerning maintaining relations with non-humans uh, can also help us imagine our relationship with AI systems. And um, if you look closely, you'll see that I missed the photo op uh, because I actually snuck off to the ICLDC poster session and we forgot to Photoshop me in later. <laughs> um, so after that initial workshop, we returned to Hawaii, a, a small subset of 15 participants returned to Hawaii in May, end of May, the same, uh, the same year for what was meant to be a writing workshop. But in our situation, we were kind of pre-assigned uh, into recommended groups. And our recommended group had the tentative title of team prototype. And we looked around the room and we saw we have two software engineers Joel and Michael, we have a data scientist, Caleb, we have access to these amazing Hawaiian language and culture and knowledge keepers, uh, Dr. Arista and Ika Aka. And then of course there's me with a prior life as a nerd herder or project manager for technical projects. So it just kind of like, we just looked at each other and we said, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to write theoretically or are we going to just build something? So, of course, we decided to just, you know, spontaneously turn this week into a hackathon. And 20 months later, um, with intense discussions and uh, spanning, I think, 20 time zones in total, the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial uh, Intelligence position paper came out, uh, was officially published on July 14, 2020. And it also includes our technology prototype and a whole section where we explain about, about that. Our technology prototype is called uh, Huaki, and maybe Nailani might explain a bit about the naming. Hey, aloha. Um, we came up with, we, we started to discuss, you know, what we're going to be, be building. And between Ika Aka and me, after we heard everyone's description of, well, what is an image recognition app doing? Um, Ika Aka came up with the word um, Huaki. And after much discussion, you know, hua um, can be a shortening of the word hua olalo or hua on its own means word and ki'i means image. But in Ika Aka's thinking about it, he said, well, hua also means fruit or seed um, or to grow, right? 
and ki'i can also mean to fetch, pluck, or pick. So he put the word phrase into a little mo'olelo or story. The elision of the two word meanings presents our language as a ripe, juicy fruit that is so tantalizing that we want to pick it. And if we do not, the hua, the fruit, will fall to the ground, wasted. And as in most carefully constructed or not Hawaiian word plays, additional layers were built into the name. The first is playful and pretty easy to remember, hua and ki'i, appealing maybe to kids and families. The second reveals our intention to nourish our people with words from their language, uh, um, while also inspiring hope that what is planted with this first prototyping project will continue to take root and thrive, not only in a Hawaiian context, but be absolutely taken up and used in other um, indigenous language contexts. Um, and so uh, the kauna or um, acorn kind of meaning in there uh, allows people, uh, we offer an invitation to people to open themselves up to deepen engagement, but it's also really playful. So it uses a Hawaiian kind of twist on, on naming that isn't always like hidden and esoteric, but are really playful. Mahalo. Yeah, mahalo, Noilani. I will now share a short video. Oh. I, I'm sorry, I seem to be having some. You're not sharing a screen either. Yeah, I know, I know. There we go. Sorry about that. So this is a video that we made to introduce the app. So there you go. Um, that's the Hua Ki'ia that Michael will walk you through in a little bit. Um, and I just always love watching this video and seeing that surprise in Noilani's face. The meaning for cup is Ki'aha. Who would have known? <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I think Caleb, do you want to? start giving the basics on artificial intelligence. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, yeah, tēnā kata katoa, uh, ko kēnā tōku ingoa, uh, no waimaho ko Ngāpu i nui tonu te, uh, te iwi, ko te mahu re hure te apu. So my name is Caleb Moses. Um, yeah, like I'm here in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, my tribe is uh, Ngāpui of the far north of, you know, of our country. And um, I'm a data scientist uh, working on language technologies for Māori language. And 
uh, I had this, you know, really great opportunity to work with, you know, the kind of the Huaki team on this indigenous protocol and um, artificial intelligence uh, project. And um, it, was, it was a really great time. And I'm, I'm just here to talk uh, a little bit about AI and language technology and, you know, um, my views and how they all fit together. So with no, without any further ado, let's go here. So what I'll just present. No, that don't want to work. Oh, now what's happening? Okay. Yeah, now, can you see it? Why are you stuck on, no, you should be able to see it. Good. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about AI and just kicking off. So um, the state of indigenous language technology. So at the moment, um, you know, I think that we can all see that language technology is undergoing this kind of huge transformation. So now we're kind of um, seeing um, language, you know, language algorithms and so on being deployed at great scale across people's devices onto phones and, you know, laptops and so on. And um, there's a, increasingly a drive towards, you know, providing uh, like uh, kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence driven uh, language services to people in the real world. And um, that's all really great uh, in a manner of speaking, but um, there are also problems where um, the benefits of these technologies are distributed very uh, inequitably in our society. So you've got some languages that have got heaps of resources and there are lots of algorithms for them. And you've got other languages where uh, there's very little um, available for people to use. And so, um, you know, obviously you've got your English where, you know, you can talk to your phone in English, you can talk to your phone in Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, um, and so on. But um, there are a lot of language communities that are shut out by that process. And so, um, you know, our indigenous languages are among, among uh, some of the kind of hardest hit by these sorts of technologies. It's not, very, it's not very common for indigenous people to be able to talk to their devices in, in whatever their language may be. And certainly that's even true uh, here in New Zealand. And it's something that we're working on fixing uh, in my day job. Um, but uh, Indigenous communities, you know, we're also very motivated to engage. So it's like, um, you know, we see ourselves as, um, as innovators, as people who kind of drive for change and, and also who have a lot of cultural knowledge that's kind of, and like to apply it towards, you know, the proliferation of our own languages and also the um, allowing them to flourish and ensuring intergenerational transmission. So there is this need for um, widely available uh, you know, ind indigenous language technology. Um, and just talking a little bit about how this technology works. So, you know, just generally speaking, you know, artificial intelligence, it works by generalizing patterns which are discovered from large data sets. So the idea is that you'll collect some large uh, volume of data, be it, you know, and in, in the case of language, this takes the form of uh, text corpora, uh, you might collect speech recordings, um, labeled speech recordings. So you might like collect a, you know, a database of utterances and then label each utterance with the, the text that was spoken and then use that to train an algorithm to do a different task, such as you know, speech recognition or speech synthesis. And um, the job for the computer is to take that kind of large data set and then just um, discover patterns, you know, find transformations, compress information, basically find ways um, to um, kind of transform their data that are relevant to performing a specific task. So um, a little bit about some of these tasks here on the next slide. So um, here are some common, so there are four common tasks that are, um, you know, people will apply artificial intelligence to in the language sector. So you've got your translation, you've got speech recognition, um, which is speech to text, speech synthesis, and then text generation. And um, there are others like, you know, question answering and so on and so on. But um, those are kind of the four big ones that people um, tend to be thinking about in the language modeling world. So, and um, for each of them, uh, for, for all four of those, of those tasks, the state of the art performance is achieved using these kind of deep learning neural networks approaches. And like the, on the right-hand side, there's like a schematic for one 
block like what operation but what you can kind of see is that there's like inputs and there's outputs and in between those two there's like a complicated um you know network of um of transformations you know you do this operation you do that operation and then these these operations get arranged into blocks which again have their own kind of crazy structure but um the point is that they kind of provide a way of um uh what's the word kind of performing the task in an automated fashion and then the, the goal um there's a there's a lengthy training process where you um you run the model through various examples. It takes predictions, uh, it makes predictions, and then um, you score its predictions relative to what you know, and then provide feedback. And then the whole system is updated, and then, um, you know iteratively improves um, up to some limit. Uh, yeah. So there's that. So um, with regards to applying AI to these under resourced languages. Um, such as indigenous languages, you know, Māori language and uh, Kanaka Māori, well, I mean, Wamuole and Hawaii, and so on. Uh, there are there are some really big gaps, and so um, I also want to talk a bit about those. So you've got uh, at the beginning, you've got kind of cultural knowledge and expertise, and so you know the the problem there can be that um, uh, it may be hard to source people who have. Uh, who know the language really well, or maybe um, there are lots of people who know the language really well, but um, those people might not be in the tech communities who have these kind of, um, who have the capability to um, train these complicated models. Um, there are also problems around, you know, um, how how to connect with language communities. So like, um, you know, there are common design problems, you know, in the tech industry, uh, exist around you know people trying to make things but not really knowing who their tar target audience is and um, if you kind of if you're like a, a tech company who is perhaps well-meaning but um, not actually connected to people on the ground then you can easily um, kind of make things that um, they don't address the problems that they're interested in or you know like if you if you're actually trying to drive towards some kind of um you know, uh, inter intergenerational transmission of, of language and so on. Like it, it takes, uh, you know, like you need access to those people so that you can learn about what it is that they need. And, um, and doing so can also save you a lot of time and resource as well. Um, uh, there, are, there are also really big computational gaps. So um, some of these really large models that get trained to do um, you know, to do speech recognition and so on, like the, the bleeding edge stuff, you know, out of Google and so forth. Um, you're talking like like over a million, you know, like like computers that that are like kind of multi-million dollar machines, <laughs> you know, that um, that crunch through all this data in a matter of, of um, perhaps days. And um, for a person to do it on, you know, uh, what's the word, non-commercial hardware, it would take you know easily over a month or multiple months in order to do the same kind of work, which is um, a pretty big gap. Um, I'm still uh, in the work that I do. We try to operate in a, in, a, in a gap in the middle where you know, like we we try not to be so ambitious as to as to make things that are so complicated that um, people with smaller language communities couldn't hope to use it. But you also like want something that's powerful enough that it gives good performance um, as well. And um, there, yeah, so a bit about training data. So also, you know, these text corpora, um, these uh, kind of speech, li uh, speech libraries, so, you know, if you make a database fill it with speech recordings, those are really hard to, uh, it's really hard to accumulate that kind of data at the, at the sort of scale you need in order to um, train machine learning models, like really machine learning models um, just kind of vaguely speaking, they don't tend to, to give great performance until you've got like hundreds of thousands of, of individual examples of the problem that you're interested in. And um, that can be really challenging to collect data for um, as well. And um, in the case of um, like under resource languages, there, there may be certain kinds of data that they have a lot of, like, you know, like in Hawaii, they have the, the Hawaiian newspaper archives, which provides a lot of text. So they're text rich, but they might be audio poor compared to New Zealand, where in New Zealand, we're audio rich because we have, you know, Māori radio stations that broadcast 24 seven. 
and there's about 21 of them. And, you know, so we've got lots of audio, but it's not labeled audio, but we do have, but compared to the Hawaiians, we have less text, uh, paradoxically. So, and then, yeah, there are also issues around raising capital as well. But I mean, that's, um, every, I, I suspect everyone is in that boat, unless you're, you know, uh, one of the big four. Um, so in terms of um, what we want or what we're working towards, we're really trying to drive um, to enable Indigenous language communities to develop their own technology, um, or at least, um, you know, to give them a head start. So um, we're, like, we're interested in creating tools that people can pick up, that they can, um, you know, port, port or make, it, make available, available to their, their own language, language communities, communities really easily. easily. And then the second, the second reason that we're doing this is because uh, we want to ensure that the sovereignty and the benefits derived from those technologies go to those communities. So this, um, <clears throat> you can have the scenario where, you know, again, you might have a rather large tech company who, um, you know, even if they take interest in your, in your under-resourced under language, they say, hey, you know, we want to provide Google Translate uh, in Māori. What happens there is you, there's a really asymmetric relationship that forms where, you know, Māori communities at great uh, expense uh, may accumulate data, give it to Google. Google will use it to create APIs that provide translate back to us for free. But then, you know, anyone who wants to use it for, say, a commercial purpose or whatnot, they've, um, you know, they pay Google, they pay Google money, but they're paying Google money for their own language using the data that they gave Google in the first place which is like, I think that it's a situation we'd like to avoid. We prefer if um, indigenous communities were empowered to create their own tech and that, uh, so that the, the benefits from those, those new technologies can actually go back to their people. And with that, I'm ready to hand over to Michael and Caroline for the hands-on. See. Thank you, Caleb. Uh... Yeah, so before we get started, I think what we'll do is my lovely assistant, uh, Caroline, is going to do just a real quick demo of this app, and then I'll get into how to make your very own. So take it away, Caroline. And this is the Hawaiian version of Hua Ki. Got to share your... Yeah, I'm trying, but I think it might have... Oh, okay. You can see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press go. And you see who a key loads, asks for access to the camera. You allow that. And don't worry, it's not going to upload your photos anywhere. Uh, it only uses it for the image recognition. And so what you do is you point it at an object like this cup, press the photo, and it says, Ki Aha. Great. And sometimes, here's the fork. Oh. Pola. And Kele Pona. So that's that. Thanks, Yara. And so maybe just before I hand it off to everyone there. Um, so just to real quickly, this is how it works. It's a on device. Number one privacy issues there is that. Uh, Everything is happening on the phone. So you're not uploading the images to a server. Typically, that's actually what you would do is you take a picture and then it gets uploaded to the server, like either Amazon, Google, whoever, Rackspace. And it gets, uh, there's an AI server out there that processes your image and then sends back the response. You've actually, I've engineered in the past week so that it's all on device. So there's no privacy concerns. The only thing it's doing is that when it's loading, you see the camera icon spinning and what's going on is that it's loading the AI. And so what's happening here is that you send in the picture, uh, say it's a picture of a dog. Uh, the AI looks at it, uh, runs its uh, uh, Caleb Maori magic, <laughs> and then it spits out a word for what it saw. In this case, it would see maybe a dog. Uh, and then what we do is then we intercept the, the response with the dictionary file, 
and then translate that into the line. And the, the, this is amazing and great. It makes it easy to develop, but also there's some limitations which we'll get into later on. And so I think the first thing we want to do is if you point your phone, get your phone out. And if you point at this, put turn on your camera app, this will bring up the link and turn on the, uh, it sends you to the URL. And the URL is uh, huakii indigenousai.dev and I'll put it into the uh, chat as well. You can also do this on your desktop if you don't have your phone handy, but I encourage you to do it on your phone because it's a little more useful uh, for you on your, yeah, your mobile device since it has a really good camera built into it. Um, and so if you have questions or something is unclear or if I'm moving too fast, please put it in the QA or put it in the chat. Um, I'll watch that. Okay, so now that everyone got it on their phone, you'll notice at the top of the app that there's sort of this little icon here. It's actually like a cat um, octopus. It's the GitHub logo. Uh, and what that would do is actually take you to this page, which is the GitHub page. And I'll also copy paste that into the uh, chat right now. And so how do you create your own version of this for your language? Uh, one thing to take note is that there is a limitation. So if you go to the GitHub page here, you'll see that there's a docs folder. And in that docs folder is a dictionary.json file. And this is how it works. So I was describing earlier in the diagram, uh, the dictionary, that's the dictionary here. So if you go in there and you replace uh, these words with your language, you will have your very own app. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that there's a limitations here and that the AI model only recognizes 80. And so we filled that 80, uh, 72 of those 80 words. And, and so it's been pretty, that's how, so we're limited to what the AI recognizes. We're using an AI uh, and model provided by Google, uh, which is pretty limited to only 80 words. Um, there are other bigger models out there that will give you uh, over a thousand words. Uh, that was just untractable uh, given our limited resources, but someone could do that. Um, okay, so is, is there at least a few people out there who have got it on their phone? If you put like a thumbs up in the chat, uh, make sure my, my mic is working. <laughs> or raise, your, raise your hand, use got it? the Good. raise your hand. Awesome, cool. Okay, so this is how what we're gonna do. So there's a couple of ways to fork this or create your own app. Um, the hard way is go through GitHub, which I'll talk about later. But the easy way is if you go to the Glitch website. So if you're on your browser or on your mobile phone, you can go to huaki glitch indigenousai.dev, and that's going to load the Glitch version. And there's two versions. There's the, the, the GitHub version and the Glitch version. And what you can then do is click the Remix button, which is these little trout here. Um, and then when that does, it loads up the Glitch website. And the cool thing is that, and I'm going to hand it off to my lovely assistant, is that you can do this all on your phone. So if you're following the law on your phone, you can completely do this end to end. So I'm going to hand it back to Caroline, who's going to sh show you how to do that. And I'll, I'll walk it verbally. So if you share your phone again, Caroline. Share your own. Um, yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. So what happens when you share the, you create the remix on Glitch is you're gonna go here and then Caroline is now gonna click on the dictionary.json. And if you click the little icon in the top right, the, yeah, there you go, perfect. And so there you go. So this is where you would change it. And we got like a, a, a read magdans gave us some words. And so we're gonna go in there and replace the, the word for cup with I'm going to butcher this column and <laughs> go on. And, um, please forgive me, Reed. <laughs> I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> but what we're going to do is uh, to demonstrate how easy it is. And then there's bowl and phone. Um, and then, so okay. we can change. I changed the word for cup. Okay. And then, so what you then do, so we just, obviously, you uh, and the audience will want to do is fill this out more. And then what you then do is you click the, there's sunglasses at the top of the, the page and you do in a new window. And what that does is launches your very own app. Um, and so now it's loaded, allow. And then if you go over to the cup 
and now we will be in in Nuptuk. I think I my saying it in in Nupik. Nupik. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm sorry. Caroline's the one who really should be saying it. So, and there you go. In five minutes, you can have your very own app. Um, one thing's important. I'll take over again, Caroline. Um, is that uh, you can do all do this? You can do this all on your phone, or awesome. This is a like Caleb is following along. <laughs> Good job. And you can even do this for Maori too, uh, Caleb. If you wanted to, you don't have to use so else's language. <laughs> I bet you have a large corpus. So everyone out there, linguists, documentarians, you guys have corpuses, and you can really easily deploy this app. Uh, of course, obviously, not every language is going to have. Uh, everything relevant um, in here because there's a lot of random things: like refrigerator, remote control, sandwich, and these you may not even have words for that. So that whatever. Uh, important thing is you do need to sign in to Glitch. I think what's going to do it's going to prompt you. Let me see here if I. What, what's going to happen is that if you don't change it, uh, let's see, I did that something wrong. Um, what happens is that you need to when you mix it on Glitch here. Come on, let me in. Okay, what happens is that it's going to ask you to um, sign in. And you can just use your Google account or Facebook or whatever you're going to use. Because if you don't sign in, your app will disappear uh, and then all your work will disappear. So what you want to do is make sure that you sign in. And otherwise, it will disappear, I think, after five days. But I wouldn't wait too long. You want to create an account as quickly as possible once you do this, uh, once you edit your, your um File. And that's pretty much it. You know, this is a web app. It works so long as the page is loaded, they'll work offline-ish. Uh, obviously, you need a website. Um, and to do it the hard way now, which is what I'll do, um, is through the proper way. Now, if you wanted to create this into an app, which you can. Unfortunately, Joe's not here, which is, uh, he's actually is the expert on mobile app development. Um, there is a harder way to do it. All the instructions on how to do it on Glitch are right here. The harder way is that if you have a GitHub account, you sign in, obviously, and then you fork it. And then there's already five people from the last session. And then what that does is create your very own version of this code. And then you go into the docs, and then you can edit your JSON file right here. And then, or you can even change the way the, the code, to, there's like the index HTML has all the code for the display in it. And also there's like little images in here for the icons. So you can even change the icons. Um, once it's all open source, we put it under the very permissive GPL3 license. We only ask that you uh, be ethical about it. <laughs> Don't go in there and say that this is a, uh, do something bad with it. Uh, and yeah, I think, there you go. I think that's my portion. If you have any questions, we'll open it up for QA next. Um, but remember now, this is limited. And I and some of those limitations, this is what uh, Nolani is going to talk about next. And good luck about remixing this. Maybe real quick, Michael, before, before Nolani jumps in, um, can you just give that chain from uh, the indigenous dev site to the GitHub site to the Glitch site? Yeah, so I'll just do a real quick recap. Uh, good point. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so, OK, let's see here. Where are you going? Let's see here. I don't want to share everything. Too big. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Come on. Is it going to the window? Seems to be sharing everything. I don't want it because it's too big of a screen. No, it's going to a window. Okay. It's not showing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I hate Zoom. Okay, so here we are. For this first thing you want to do is, of course, uh, on your mobile app, you can go here, uh, Hula Kee website. So if you do the Hula Kee Business Dev, uh, from there you can click the little GitHub icon. And then from the GitHub icon will take you to the GitHub page. So if you go there and click there, this isn't going to work on my phone because the um, the camera is being taken up by the Zoom. And from here, there are the instructions on how to remix from Glitch. And in there is a specific version to do that, which is right there, the huaki-glitch.inbusiness.dev. Uh, so when you click on that, 
um, you would go here and then you click on the, the fish version, which will then take you here uh, in glitch. And then you can edit the dictionary there. Um, and you got to make sure, like I said earlier, if you do not create an account, your data will be lost like after five days. So you want to make sure that you create a glitch account. It's pretty easy if you already have an email or a Gmail account or a Facebook account. There's also a variety of other options. Um, like I can just real quickly click on that. And you can see all these different options of uh, creating your own glitch account. And oh, yeah, uh, one thing I forgot is that when you do show your app, it creates a whole new URL. And so this will be unique to you. This one is Juniper Political Sands. I think it's like randomly generated. Uh, you will have your own version. Every time you click that remix button, a brand new version is created and I have a brand new URL. So don't use that because that was my app. What you want to do is you, whatever app gets generated for you when you click that button, that's yours. That's your personal version. Uh, yes, okay, just real quick. Thanks Caroline for reminding me to do that. Okay, take it away, Delani. <laughs> You are muted. Unmute myself. All right. Uh, let's see. Right. Hey, aloha mai kako. O noi la nia rista ko ui noa. No hono lulu mai yau. Ah, eh, eh. Ah, ikei yaman awa e ne ana i Montreal. Ah, lino ana i Polopeka ma Magill University. So aloha, my name is Noilani Arista. I'm from Honolulu. Um, at this time, my house is all upside down because I'm trying to move from Honolulu to Montreal where I can take up my position at McGill University as a professor um, in history and classics. Um, so let's see, hua ki'i, an object detector. And I called it a Hawaiian world viewer, word viewer, world viewer. And I think that Many of us, if we work in language reclamation or historical language reclamation, we all we must always um, must must be fantasizing, right, about waking up one day um, in a world where our native language is spoken everywhere around us. Um, I am reminded of the many years that I, it took me to learn Hawaiian language in college. Um, even though my grandmother was a native speaker, um, she didn't. She didn't really teach the people um, who came after her, but I did hear her speak Hawaiian when I was um, younger. Um, and I remember being in Hawaiian, trying to figure out, well, how am I gonna learn all this vocabulary and taking post-its and sticking them around the room to name objects in my sort of daily routine of living. Um, Hua Ki'i is this innovative like app that lets you use your digital device as almost a point and click dictionary. Uh, hua Ki'i was an important exercise for me to engage in because it allowed me to take my decades of training in Hawaiian language and research in Hawaiian language archives, work that mostly occurred on paper or with uh, native speakers, um, and more recently has shifted to computers uh, during the pandemic um, into a mobile digital medium. Amidst all of the approaches um, that we can devise to reclaim or return people to their languages, the power of digital applications and indigenous AI can be shaped to serve the needs of diverse communities in different stages of language growth and revitalization. In 2021, I've come to find that indigenous people can contribute to worlding our worlds, worlds again, wording our worlds again with the aid of technology without ceding sovereignty over our knowledges to large foreign corporations. To be truthful, it was a bit intimidating for me to be in a room with data scientists and computer, computer scientists um, and being placed on a project team that was developing a new technology. As the person with the least amount of training in technology, I often wondered about my capacity to contribute constructively. Building a simple list of words for hua ki'i to sync with images occurs for me within the context of works that I am very familiar with, Hawaiian language dictionaries. So I prepared a slide of 
some, but not all of the Hawaiian language dictionaries that we have available to us in Hawaiian. Um, and after all of my years sort of working in print mediums, I could probably tell you a little bit about each of the dictionaries and the, the differences and the kind of special things that are incorporated into each different dictionary. Um, the 1887 Dictionary of Hitchcock, for example, has an appendix that incorporates words and phrases in Latin or Greek in Hawaiian. Um, it also has proverbs um, and all manner of other kinds of extra material like names in Hawaiian or common phrases. And it also reaches back to uh, produce words um, in English into Hawaiian that we don't have in the 1986 dictionary. Um, so each dictionary had its own kind of flavor. Um, as part of my work as a historian, I'm often building specialized word lists um, for projects in Hawaiian religion or legality or governance. So being asked to build a short reference list for this program seemed you know, really unproblematic. And yet, um, as it happened, on the day that we were compiling, working on compiling a common list of words, Ika Aka Peng, the other team member who uh, is fluent, was fluent in Hawaiian, and I were sort of sitting at the kitchen table going, okay, you know, book, puke, we said in unison, ka ki aha, fire hydrant, paipu kinai ahi. Then we got to the innocuous word backpack, and I said, eke kua, and he said, paiki. And I said, no, eke kua, for your back, bag for your back. And he said, no, paiki. And we were, we found ourselves at sort of this little humorous impasse where we were bickering over one word. And since we only had a week to build this app, this prototype, I turned to my Facebook page to crowdsource responses and surprisingly generated a discussion largely held in the Hawaiian language on the subject. How do you say backpack in Hawaiian? So here's a screenshot of the, the discussion. I sort of elided it. It went on for like six pages this size. And there were 20 different responses, uh, respondents, representing words from 10 different places, including elementary and intermediate schools um, situated across the archipelago. We had responses from people who were familiar with dialects on Niiho, on Kauai, on Oahu, on the Big Island. Um, five people said eke, uh, one, one person said we would shorten that to slang and say ex. Um, four people said eke kua. One of the older teachers who's a Hawaiian expert, Akumuhula, said he thought that one of his students had coined this term, which I thought was really interesting because I had heard it as a student um, 20 something years ago um, at the university. Um, four people said paisi or paiki, the variation. Six said paiki ha ave. One professor said that he thought that the word ha ave indicated um, that the speaker must become be coming from Hilo because he identified that usage as belonging to the people at UH Hilo. Eke ha ave was four people who were in between, kind of Oahu usage of eke and Hilo usage of ha ave. But then I went back and I looked in the uh, Hawaiian language, one of the Hawaiian language dictionaries and saw that ha ave is to carry a burden on the back. And I thought for precision, for um, thinking about how do we create words for everyday usage, I thought that was a really great usage um, to bring, bring into the present. Um, what I liked about crowdsourcing on Facebook was that it allowed me to get real time and relational engagements to build dictionaries. And in our little disagreement, uh, Ika Aka won. So we went with Paiki Paisi um, for the word. Finally, um, when we're thinking, oh, I, I, I didn't finish. Um, the nuances that were emer emerged from that discussion were interesting to me. People were able to tell us the source for their word, as I, as I kind of talked you through. Most of them had school-aged children or were reaching back to when they were in, in immersion. 
And most of the people responding were parents or teachers, or they were talking to their kids in real time saying, hey, what's the word? What do you use? And I really like I, I really like that we're able to sort of have a discussion about language, something that we we don't really convene kind of discussion groups for really so that I found that part of working on the project really, I really enjoyed that part. Um, now, you know, when I first started 25 years ago, everything was pen and paper or pencil and paper. And I had to carry around three, two or three dictionaries to my project projects when I was working with elders and sort of annotate my written dictionaries. And now we have online Hawaiian language dictionaries like the um, vehevehe.org, and for ourselves, this project, Huaki'i, we imagined it as part of a broader suite of um, applications that we could create in our communities. And when we thought about artificial intelligence and everything connected to that, that if we were the creators of that, what would we call it? And we came up with the word kuano, thoughtful, meditative, comprehending, thinking as a, a word maybe for indigenous Hawaiian AI. Um, so you see the, the, the Huaki'i slide here on the left that Ika Aka drew on his iPad. And he and I like started to fantasize beyond sort of the point and click word. Maybe we could point the camera at a place and it could tell us the place names. We could G, GPS or GIS locate places. And then maybe at some point we could populate place names with mo'olelo or the stories about a place. And so you can see we, we dream, we imagined very large, like we imagined big and we went beyond sort of the boundaries of where we are now. Um, and I think that's what the technology allows us to do is to, to think about how we transform, how we, we um, the transmediation of Mo'olero Hawai'i from different mediums, right? I study the period from orality into print and writing, but I believe we're going through this new shift now where we're moving from text, you know, paper-based to the digital mediums. And how do we, I just had one story about um, when I was uh, in third year Hawaiian and it was an immersion class. We took a trip to Maui with our teachers and to Manaleo, Uncle Eddie, Ka'ana Ana, and Tutu Hale. And I was standing there with Uncle Eddie at, at a lookout point in Hana and the rain started to, to mist over the mountain above us. And I pointed to it and I said, Uncle Eddie, I said to him, you know, okera ua. And he kind of looked down and he looked a little crestfallen and, um, and I thought, oh, I heard his feelings. I said something wrong. And then he said to me, well, you know, and then I realized that I, could, I had kind of embarrassed him. Like, and I had asked the wrong question. And why that was the wrong question was because he wasn't raised on that part of the island or that island. He was raised in a fishing um, village in, in um, I'm thinking Hana now, he, on, on the big island. And that was just the wrong question to ask. So I think about when we create these digital mediums that we have to create them in relation to the realities that our ancestors and that we live, right? That even though we try to load all of our knowledge onto a digital device, that we really have to be conscious about the disciplining that goes into creating the structures that, that maintain our knowledge is as separable and distinct, right? That this knowledge came from a particular place, that we don't collapse all knowledge and make it into everything, all, all Hawaiian knowledge. And that's the only caveat I would have about creating digital devices is that we remember that the purpose of creating an aid to our learning is so that we become the knowledge keepers, we become the ones with that ike that lives with us and in our families. And the digital device isn't the smart thing. We, we are still the ones that have sovereignty and relationship and all of those things with our knowledge. And that's, that's what I have to share today about kuaki'i and kuano'o and hope that everyone can 
you know, sort of think about these things and find ways to appropriate this app and use it in your own uh, language context. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Nailani. And, and thank you for reminding us all of how, how we came to Huaki was actually from looking at a, a larger picture, a potential future of, of having a lot of different types of knowledge combined. And, and Huaki is only you know, a very small possible subset. Um, just to kind of get started on that. And yeah, like you said, the knowledge uh, is always with us. The tools are only supportive. They are not going to be what saves the language if we don't save it and the culture and the knowledge. We have to do this uh, as people and we can use the technology to assist us with that. Um, and part of the user interface addresses some of the things that Noilani mentioned just now. Um, because like she said, we started out with this bigger picture and then we also collected a wish list. And, um, and as we were collecting the wish list and putting out ideas, we also uh, had this discussion of, you know, what, what are the things that should be able to do um, and as the backpack discussion came up, it became aware to us that um, it's not just a location of this is the location of a language, but maybe even this is the location of a language variant. So the Hilo variant of Hawaiian is different from the Oahu Honolulu variant, and it should be possible to adjust accordingly. We also had uh, feedback options similar to, to replicate that, that kind of discussion that came out of the backpack situation. And um, because I saw that earlier in the Q&A or chat, uh, the, the zebra being a terminology that's not very important for Inupiaq in Alaska, we had a similar situation uh, for Hawaiian where we said, okay, the word for skis, um, maybe there is a Hawaiian word for skis, but it's not really important. Uh, so we just didn't fill that item. Um, but something I just wanted to emphasize here with our user interface design, one of the things that we paid much attention to was that we wanted people to uh, immerse themselves in their language and also not be hobbled by maybe uh, insecurities of how to spell something. And that is why we, we went with uh, eradicating English in the user interface, having iconography instead and using the image recognition as a way of asking this mobile dictionary um, for the Hawaiian term for cup or bowl or fire hydrant or whatever. And as you just noticed in Michael's hands-on section, uh, it is easily extensible for more indigenous languages. So there you go. This is our workshop. Uh, we are now ready for the Q&A section. And uh, yes, mahalo, thank you very much. We're excited to be able to share this with you. Yeah, so what we'll do is, um, so there's a consistent couple of questions that are gonna come up and then we'll answer the, if you have questions, please raise your hand. But real quickly, Caleb, I think you'd be the best position to answer this. Why can't we add new words to this model? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the answer is that we can, but we can't do it cheaply, right? <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, and the, you'll 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 have seen um, you know on the site that there's this JSON dictionary file that you can use to edit. Basically, those um, those words that are in there are locked in because we're using a pre-trained model. So there's um, a model which someone in the Q and A pointed out. It's called Co Coco SSD, and it's it's designed to recognize you know 80 different um, 
kinds of objects and um, return labels for them. And um, the, the Coco data set was trained to search for those certain, those particular objects. And um, in order to make a model that could detect something different, you need to train a separate model. Um, you could potentially look around, like shop around and like find, look for other large, perhaps larger models that can detect um, different things or maybe more useful things. Um, but um, if you wanted to kind of, if you, if you had in mind particular, perhaps culturally relevant objects that you wanted to detect, then you would have to, you, you have to assemble your own training data set, um, you know, collection of, a collection of images of those objects and um, uh, train, a, train an algorithm to detect them as a separate task. So you'd have to do that before you can. But once you did, then you'd have to figure out a way to, you know, basically ship it. So how would you, you'd have to create a service that, um, oh, well, I guess you could do a client side, right? But I mean, this is all kind of, this is all like you're well heavily into the weeds of um, kind of AI development now um, by the time you're considering that problem. But um, I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that people who, who decide to take this project on for their own communities may um, find interesting shortcuts to some of these problems. Yeah? So um, at the moment, um, we kind of set it up to run quickly. And um, the, the Coco model, which only finds 80 objects, there are larger models and we could have um, prepared the model for those. But in that case, the, um, in those cases, the, uh, the dictionary became complicated to set up. You know? So if you've got a thousand words, you have to translate all thousand words and um, that takes time. And um, that might be something that's more, uh, that's easier for someone to do you know, with a language background. Um, so yeah, in that case, the shopping around idea might be relevant. But anyway, I've kind of gone the full loop. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so I think the uh, the takeaway is that it would be a huge endeavor, endeavor and it would probably take, honestly, months, if not years, because now I'll show you real quickly, um, the Coco data set, um, just for banana, because this actually came up last time, has 2,346 images. And so it's, it's a non-trivial task. It's, it's a very significant effort to create your own visual AI. Uh, but as Caleb said, technology has advanced, um, and it's very likely that there's this thing called transfer learning, which is actually a very deep concept. So it is possible to take this AI and then create your own more culturally relevant, but I think, quite frankly, it would be a significant effort. Um, but it'd be totally doable, and if someone finds a grant, I think me and Caleb would definitely be interested in working with you guys and creating a culturally relevant model that's not the Coco SD. So that's pretty much the, the short the short takeaway is that it'd be really expensive. It'd be, you need a significant amount of energy and effort. Uh, okay, so we'll just go on to the live questions. Uh, Lane, are you prepared to ask a question? And if you have any personal want to talk, raise your hand, please. Okay, Lane. Lane Sports. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, sorry, I, I, hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I think you already mostly answered the questions. Uh, yeah, I was. I, I I am from a computer science background, and I have my own servers. So I would be interested and have the capacity to run the experiments. I I think for me, what would be useful is if there were a template similar, ju just a template that says, "Okay, here, give us your give us your labeled image data, and pop out at the other end." Uh, uh, file that I can then host on my web server along with, uh, and, and just point the point, point the JavaScript to it to use for my model instead of the other model. Yeah, it will be, it's doable. I mean, it's just, it's I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not an image person. I, I do work in machine translation and morphology, computational morphology, but something like that, if anybody knows the how to of training coco style data um, that would that that process might be very useful uh, for people who do have the hardware cool. i could i don't know this is that's a fair point 
like I feel like I could probably do that in a weekend. Um, I will <laughs> think about that. Because yeah, I, I, from, from my perspective, that would also be a really straightforward way to get huge, potentially huge amounts of community engagement. So yeah. I work with the St. Lawrence Island Yupik community and I could easily imagine pointing that, I mean, I'm planning on probably this week pointing the demo and showing it on Facebook with mm. Yupik examples for these 80, 80 categories. And I could easily see if I do that and say, hey, if you guys could provide me with images, labeled images of all of the important sites on the villages and the, the culturally specific items, I could train a model and I could easily imagine lots of community support for, or at least potentially for kind of a crowdsourced data set of, of culturally specific images. Yeah, yeah, and uh, to uh, just real quickly, real cost on you is that, so the Coco, and I'm not sure about modern, the Coco is actually kind of old. Um, I think it's like at least 10 years old, I believe, right, uh, Caleb? Uh, it's pretty old. Uh, what they do is they outline in like some sort of editing program, outline the object. So the banana actually has an outline. So the label isn't just like image, this is a picture of Lane. It's like your whole profile is outlined. Now I'm not, I, I think we, I think I do trust in Caleb's uh, genius. I'm sure he could figure out a way. Um, I'm not an image uh, AI expert either. So, but just to be aware that there's a lot of sure. nuances to this topic too. But yeah, that's true. Cool. Yeah, I think that the, um, yeah, providing those um, polygons to encapsulate the images is also tricky. I, it'd be, I know that there are, I don't know. Yeah, I could, I could certainly come up with a way to um, kind of automate um, training a model like that, you know, for, you know provided that you have the, the images and possibly also those uh, polygons as well. But um, for me, the harder problem would be coming up with a front end in order to actually facilitate that crowdsourcing effort. Um, I had I had ideas um, that I mentioned on the last workshop around. Um, you could potentially do things like scrape Instagram hashtags and stuff for examples of things. Um, but yeah, there's like, those are the kinds of ideas um, that have come to mind. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Let, let me know. I'd be happy to continue the discussion on that. I think you have my contact lane. We've met before. I'm sure we, yeah. I think we, I think we barged into one of your conferences. So anyways, you did, you showed up. At the <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I think you just said, uh, don't eat lunch, but otherwise you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for, anyway, so we will move on to the next question. Thank you, Lane. Uh, Reed Magdans, do you want, still want to ask your question? Reed? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Hey. I, I think you kind of, you kind of got into them largely. I was, I was curious about the same thing, like whether we could, if we don't, if our language doesn't have translation for translations for terms, do we just delete those from the JSON and then uh, about adding them, which you guys have been having a good discussion about? Yeah, uh, yeah. So actually, that situation came up with uh, with our app, like Ski. There was it just didn't make sense. I don't remember the exact definition, but I'm going to put Nalani on the spot for that. For what? Uh, why didn't we do ski? Ski is one of the words that get down. Uh, oh recognized. yeah, we had a laugh about that. Like, why would we, like, why would we have, we don't have like really a use for skis. It's like, I don't know. It's like I joke with my friends who are from really cold places. They'll say something like, we have a thousand words for snow. And I'll be like, we probably have that for ocean stuff. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's really contextual. And that's why. I don't know. I think that I said this in the last one that I think that what we have to do is we have to bring together the bookend of language expert, cultural expert together with technology. Right. And those two things need to become married in programs. Now we have to stop thinking of them as separable because we all have ideas about what we want and what we want the technology to do. We just need more people like Caleb who can say, I could probably figure that out in a weekend. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I got to say, I've been really spoiled working with this intertribal group of people um, because 
you know, when you when you work intertribally, you can also slip all of the yeah. typical political issues or problems that you're always going to be having if you're always just working at home and also working with a group of people who aren't Hawaiian, who are from different places and have different experiences really enrich the process. And and you, I, I don't know, it can't speak for every, I can't speak for Michael, but it made me approach everybody with a little bit more res, more kind of respect because I wasn't sure about anything, right? And that experience was really, it's different for a person like me and maybe for Caleb, I can't ask, I can't speak for him, but Hawaiians are like the, mostly like the only native people in Hawaii. The, the, we're identified as the native people of Hawaii, right? We're not in this unbounded sort of continental territory where there are, it's a multi-tribal situation. So this kind of experience was really novel for me. Um, it's an experience I had more of when I went into the Pacific, like to Rapa Nui or Tahiti or Aotearoa, where I'm not the person from there. So just to say, like, we can also do this work um, in, you know, uh, intertribally sort of pan-Indigenous, right? And not have to melt down or boil down all of our differences, but that the differences actually matter to make things really, really wonderful. I don't know. <laughs> That's great. So a couple, a couple of questions has come up from Mizuki, and I'm um, going to... Maybe just question. real quick, Reed, was that... Was that answering your question? Uh, yeah, that covered it. Thank yeah. you. Thank so you. I'm going to put Mizuki on the spot. You've been, you have an interesting idea on how to turn this into a uh, a classroom activity. Maybe you can explain what you mean or your question more. Hi, Michael. Um, Caroline, good to see you. So uh, which questions? Oh, like you were saying, like, can you put this in the classroom? So maybe maybe you can explain. Yeah, what you I mean, mean, uh, I mean, in, in uh, not um, um, uh, so much about the classroom, but to encourage young students from um, uh, communities, indigenous communities. I'm thinking about some couple um, communities in Montana that I um, uh, support their revitalization efforts, and. Um, they are really into um, teaching languages in the classroom. So maybe the classroom situation too. But um, sometimes that, uh, in the places that we go to um, type of education or the STEM education is very different. What well, yeah, the goals that the students have or well, yeah, the type of the households that they have. Um, some students very struggle. So I was wondering if this could be actually um, something that to um, encourage them to follow their education and maybe eventually to join their, their own language realization project. So I was asking if this, um, the, the level wise is something that they can jump in right now. And it sounds like it is. So um, I'm very um, fascinated by the work that you guys do doing right now. And uh, another one was, uh, is it gonna, is, is it, is there room for the, the app to include sounds? Yeah, so I think as far as the classroom, I think uh, we've, I've done this once before with a different app. Um, the kids actually usually get it faster than the adults. <laughs> I think that was with uh, Loretta Todd, we did like an I for Indigenous Media Matrix um, a, a lesson, something similar to this. And the younger the kid I have found is actually they're better, like they understood right away what glitch mm -hmm. was and like doing that. As far as sound, that would require, I think some engineering, but actually it would be totally, actually it wouldn't be that hard. What you would do is um, you would want to create like an MP3 folder. And every time you click the, uh, the button, uh, what you can do, there's a piece of code in there that says, oh, we saw something. And then we can probably just associate that the MP3 with the word. And so actually the easiest thing would be to name the MP3, like say airplane, it'd be airplane.mp3 and then we could uh, that would be totally doable. Um, it would require some engineering effort. It's not mm -hmm. something, uh, it's yeah, something I I've considered. Go ahead. It's a great idea to have some room so that they, to motivate them to go, you know, to learn more about this. So I think yeah, actually like, that yeah. could be a programming exercise right there. Like that yeah. could be, hey, uh, remix this to add audio. That would be, no, that's a totally awesome I'm engineering. I'm going to be contacting you. 
Yes. Thanks. <laughs> you know our contact. You know, we, we know Mizuki, yeah. everyone. Yes. So we're all from Montana. Um, yeah, if you work this with Salus or Blackfeet, I assume. Um, no, I think we, to we totally want to Thank work you. with our own home communities. Okay. okay. Uh, so then we're going to, there's some QA questions. Um, so Rochelle Allen asks, uh, could related islands be picked up, uh, for instance, a wild ski? Uh, no, unfortunately, it's really brittle in that regard. If it's, it has to be like the canonical uh, object that is defined in the Cocoa data set. Uh, I put the link into the Cocoa data set. I'll put it in here, okay? But if it's not um, in there, it won't recognize it. The thing about AI is that if it never has seen it before, it's really hard for it to see anything. Oh, maybe if it's like approximately closer, it depends upon the, the parameters of what it's seen. Uh, it's more like some deep AI discussion around what exactly that means. Um, now, it's actually kind of related to, I'm not going to even try the first name, uh, Solomon's. Um, so we have found that the problem with the data set is very white. <laughs> if you have the, a WASP, you know, white Anglo-Saxon person bowl, uh, the bowl that Caroline used was the most white bowl we had in the house, basically. <laughs> so it's not going to recognize a bowl that has like maybe like those beautiful Mexican bowls or even like the, the Southwestern, you know, clay bowls. It will not recognize it. It, it will think it's something else randomly. And so, it, it, again, it's a problem of... Um, uh, I guess a little bit of colonialism in the data set. The data set is very white oriented, very, you know, quite frankly, the data set you can show that it was made in San Francisco. And so things that are common to the San Francisco life experience, that's what will get recognized. Uh, hey, aloha, yeah. Ali Leo. Um, we, we came up with this question too yesterday, and the example was what different kinds of bananas, right? <laughs> yes. That, right? Like, <laughs> 31 flavors of bananas, I don't know, which we might have in Hawaii or in the Pacific. And so it goes back to the question that Caleb answered earlier about training the model to see um, through our way of seeing. And it's, you know, earlier on with Aloha 365, we did try to direct our audience, hey, if you have pictures of X, hashtag it with Aloha 365. And I could run through you know, things and pull images to theoretically, you could maybe like Caleb said, scrape them to scrape them if they're random, but I directed my audience to do it. So scrape them to have a data set, but then you have to prep that data set the way that, you know, you showed it yesterday, you showed the outlines and the, remember, like, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people know what you mean when you say that thing about the outline today, you know, cause you showed it the other day workshop but you just have to prep the data set and that's 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 the time consuming thing yeah so like the bananas in these pictures like here's a good example is outlined and that's the training data set so someone or some organization went through all the trouble of looking at a bunch of pictures of bananas and labeling them bananas um, there's quite a bit of energy and effort then what you want to do is then create subcategories of that and uh, and we're kind of limited that the AI is limited to this data set, whatever, whoever someone tagged. So like to the other question earlier, like Lane was saying, it would be fairly substantial bit of energy and effort. Any other questions or any hand raises? Anyone ask the question in person? It sounds like Connor has made three apps already. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, Caroline, did you want to talk about Kupu? I don't know. I know that kind of question came up a little bit. I, I feel like I've talked too much. It's your turn. <laughs> well, uh, OK. So Kupu and there are other apps out there. I was going to look. Somebody mentioned it in the Q and A. Um, they they exist, so we're not saying this is the only visual recognizing dictionary app that that exists. We built this app during the workshop uh, out of our brainstorming session, our hackathon. Uh, after the fact, we were made aware of, oh, look, there's also the Kupu app that has the Maori terminology. Um, and 
so yes, we are aware there are others that exist and we're, uh, we're grateful that there are many different approaches. This is just one of many. Um, and we do have a different backend uh, than Kuku does. And, you know, um, we, we're teaching you how to uh, apply it for your language here, but you're very welcome to, you know, not just shop around for different AI models that would be used in the background, but also shop around for different front ends. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else to add? Yeah, and I put a link to the Kuku app. You can, there's, it's free, as far as I know. It's got an iPhone and Google Android version. It's a beautiful app, quite frankly. Um, they have some very smart people working over there. Um, we're not uh, visual designers, we're more interested. So we did make some, a lot of engineering efforts to that compromise the, 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 the full range, but it also makes it so it's really easy to copy and paste. You know, like that's the, the point was to, uh, I have a very pragmatic engineering perspective of that. Everything we do should be really easy to extend. And even if it's initially the first version is limited, someone can like Lane can come along and say, I'm going to make a, a thousand word version of it. Okay, that's perfect because the code is very easy to use and deploy. Uh, and it's really just the config setting. You just got to change one line of code and you'll be able to enable uh, bigger models. Uh, yeah. Uh, How to say it easier? Yeah. yeah, so it's like that Janet. Was yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's, we're married, if you can't tell, so you're just like just naturally to over talk each other <laughs> by default. Uh, easier to set up. I just looked at the link. Someone sent the link uh, that there's like a uh, open source version. I'll send it in the chat. And just looking at it, I get bored and sleepy. Just <laughs> like there's quite a few bit of our app is static website. And what that means is that it doesn't need a backend. So I wanted to correct Caroline. Uh, Kupu has a backend. It has a server, there's a website, and it has an AI system. We don't have that. It's strictly 100% on your device. It's client side. It's HTML. Uh, the only thing it does over the internet is obviously load itself, and then it grabs the model, the Coco SSD model we keep talking about. It pulls it off the internet, and it's like a couple megabytes or something. And so when it's loading, that's exactly what it's doing, is pulling the AI model from Google. And then it all happens on your phone. And I like that because it's private. Uh, we don't, I don't want to know your images. Like people take some pictures of interesting things. <laughs> and so I don't want to have a server that has, you know, in business pictures, you know, like uh, whatever happens in Hawaii stays in Hawaii. I don't want it on my servers. <laughs> and so wherever you're using this app, it's 100% private because it doesn't upload the photos. It's only all on client side. That's what that means. And from what I understand, Kupo, you do upload to a server. And the reason why you would want to do that is that uh, you can have a much bigger, different model. Uh, I think they recognize quite a bit more words than we do. They use a larger model. And, and so, so it makes it easier for them to expand. Uh, my goal is to make it as easy as to containerize and hand to you, like hand to other community members. So, so there's like some trade-offs. So. I think I feel like we keep going around that topic. Oh, it's of interest. People want to know. Uh, Lane, I saw you had raised your hand, but I don't see it raised anymore. Was there a question? No, I, I was the first one called on. I, I My question was okay. answered. Um, I think if there's no other question. There is, no, there is a raised oh. hand. Uh, um, Reed, I think you just didn't lower it. Read our, we are um, I actually, well, maybe. Oh. I did have a follow up actually. Okay. Um, kind of related to this discussion about expanding the words available. Um, I was just curious, like Coco seems like a pretty small sort of data set. Um, obviously like Google or large companies have extremely large data sets that can recognize thousands and thousands of things in English. And is the, I, I was just looking for like a more answer directly related to that. Um, are those like really large data sets just proprietary and we're not really able to get access to the data set that could recognize thousands of objects and translate them? Or was that a like dictionary translation issue? What's kind of the bottleneck in terms of just saying, hey, we have photo recognition for 
thousands of English objects. We just don't have access to those um, uh, models or that data. Maybe Caleb, you can maybe talk about that. Um, I'm thinking like more along the lines of that. The Cocoa data set is actually larger than the dictionary. Maybe you can explain that part. Right. Um, yeah, so there, there are actually some newer, um, well, because like there's a Microsoft Cocoa data set that's from 2017, which has got something like on the order of 100,000, hundreds of thousands of images. Um, I'm just looking at like a, actually, I, I guess I can share screen for this. Um, actually, yeah. So I'm looking at this kind of health check. Oh, wait. I shared the wrong screen. This one. So, yeah. So this is like um, the full, you know, kind of most recent version of Coco that I can see. And so you've got like a lot of categories. I think there's more than 80, but there's a long tail of um, different things. But yeah, I'm not sure. So, I mean, I'm sure that there are um, other data sets out there. I think I think the honest truth is that they probably are mostly proprietary. But um, yeah, it just se it seems like there ought to be ways to short, you know, to to shortcut the process or do it faster by, you know, basically exploiting like search engines and other stuff that we know can do the stuff behind, you know, under the hood. Like maybe you could do a Google a Google image search of like the things that you're interested in, and then you know, uh, sweep up a whole bunch of images that way, and then you're really just using um, the Google search engine as your automatic labeler. But like, yeah, um, I don't know. There's lots. There's lots of ideas. Oh, yeah, but I don't. Yeah, about. if you have more thoughts or something, or if you know, want something more direct for your question, I can elaborate on that. Yeah, we'll go to the QA, the social, I guess, after this. Um, mm -hmm. Got five minutes. Did you want to have any closing remarks since we're technically on your territory, Nolina? No, uh, Noe? <laughs> no, <Lani. laughs> She hasn't spoken up. I'd like to see, uh, make sure everyone gets uh, some speaking time. Yes, he wahi mahalo, ke ia i na koe i ako ako a mai, ke ia au i na lao. Um, I think that people just thanking people to, for their time for showing up uh, this Sunday afternoon to um, be with us to, to listen to, to our project um, that we did. And hopefully this becomes the seed for more projects and hopefully we can cross pollinate and, you know, sort of switch up teams and work together. I, I'd love to work on a Hawaiian team that wants to do more of this work. And, you know, um, I'm spoiled. I got to work with some of the best people right now in this area of knowledge, Caleb, Michael, Joel, and Caroline. Um, yeah, so, oye wale. He wahi aloha keia ya oko pakahi apo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, we're very, very grateful that uh, we had the opportunity to introduce Huaki'i to you, and uh, we're excited to see what what you will create. And like Michael said, um, just ping him and or Caleb, uh, showing showing your your new products. We're also excited to see how you improve upon. You know, this is. This is just a early version prototype and uh, we just want to get it out there and see what you do. And like Mizuki was saying, you know, adding audio is one of, one of those very important uh, additional steps for sure. And if you're interested in reading more about uh, what we did and why we did it this way. I am just going to post the link again to the position paper. And other than that, I think 
Yeah, thank you so much for the questions and the discussion and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. To the, uh, to the host, can we get the QAs exported? Is there a way to export that? Do you know? I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, it would be good to add these questions as a FAQ on the GitHub page, if it's possible. Like, I don't see any obvious ways to do it. Can and Lane, you share your uh, contact for Lane in the yeah. Q and A or in the Any of you guys who are still yeah. here? Yeah, I'm but... still here. Yes, uh, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yep. No, no, no. I I was just uh, trying to get Caleb's contact info. Yeah, um, Caleb at dragonfly.co.nz is my email. Dragonfly one word. So, Caleb at dragonfly. Yeah. Co.nz. I, I, I forwarded to it. I, I, oh, I tried to jot down yours, but anyway. Oh, uh, uh, it would be Lane. best if. Yeah. yeah, Lane, I'll email you. Yeah, yes, please. Um, that would be great. Yeah, I would think it'd be interesting to create something like this. We can maybe even try to get some. Caroline yeah, happens to know. Caroline happens to know some people at Google. We might be able to do something real. <laughs> that would yeah. be kind of cool. This, this seems like something that that Google could potentially be open to for like a, a small grant. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Keep us. Keep us. Yeah. Keep us all in the loop. I think uh, more importantly, Caroline. She's the boss. <laughs> yeah. I say, and um, Alani, of course. Yeah, I happen to know the guy. You know, I met the guy who um, made the Cooper app one sort of thing and so i just sent him a question to ask him which model they actually use but it's not obvious to me which one i think they're know. using google's image api i think that's what yeah, they're I'm, doing yeah i'm sure they are guys, but like guys yeah. just real quick they're gonna automatically close this room yeah we should, we should we um, should move to the so social room maybe move to that social thing and okay yeah okay we'll see you there. i'll need to, right. yeah yep. sweet Bye. see you there Um, I will make sure that I can get the Q and A's to you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Caroline. Much. And again, thank you to our interpreters. Um, good job. <laughs> thank you, Gina. Thank you, Jenny. Aloha. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Aloha. Yeah.